Okay, 7.30 and we're going to get started. Welcome to the November meeting of the Johnson Space Center Astronomical Society. I'm Doug Holland, the president of the JSEAS, and this is our agenda for this evening. Uh, first up, we're going to have Paul Maley. He's going to tell us about, he's going to be our main speaker tonight with Retirement Astronomy from Arizona. Then I'll be talking about what we're going to do after the uh, meeting. We're all going to meet at Mod Pizza here for the local folks. Then we'll have two members minute, one from Dan Roy and one from me. Then we'll wrap it up with Star Party News and talk about what we're going to do next month. So our main speaker tonight is Paul Maley, which most of us know. He's a kind of a famous guy in the astronomy world. He's been a member of the JSEAS for a long time and done a lot of things. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about him before he does his presentation. Paul Maley has been an amateur astronomer for the past 60 years and has been a member of the JSEAS for the past 51 years. His main interest includes solar eclipses, eclipses of stars by asteroids, and artificial satellites, artificial Earth satellites, where he contributes a page on the subject each year to the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada Handbook. He founded Ring of Fire Expeditions, which is a public outreach arm of the JSEAS to take those interested in astronomy to faraway places to observe the northern lights and eclipses of the sun. More than 2,000 people have participated in his expeditions. He has traveled to 306 countries and territories, seen 80 eclipses of the sun, which is more than any person living or dead, and successfully observed 557 eclipses of stars by asteroids. In addition, he has completed half marathons on all seven continents and founded the Clear Lake Marathon Training Trail in 2009. His most important contribution to amateur astronomy was the discovery of the first possible satellite of an asteroid some 17 years before the first confirmed asteroid satellite was captured by the Galileo spacecraft passing near the asteroid Ida in 1994. He has had photos published in Aviation Week and Space Technology, National Geographic, and other media. His astronomy videos have been shown on the Discovery Channel, ABC, NBC, and CBS News, CNN and the Science Channel, as well as appended in NASA space shuttle flight footage. Paul served as vice president of the International Occultation Timing Association, IOTA, from 1983 to 2013. He continues to be actively involved in promoting international cooperation between IOTA and amateur observers in India and in Iran in the field of occultation. He has traveled the I traveled to and worked with amateur astronomers in New Zealand, South Africa, Macedonia, and Bosnia. In September 2019, at the fifth workshop on binaries in the solar system, he received the honor of having a binary asteroid given the designation 27675 Paul Maley for his 43 years of work on asteroid occultations. He was elected as a fellow of the Explorers Club, received the G. Bruce Blair gold medal awarded by the Western Amateur Astronomers, and this month will receive the Gordon Myers Amateur Achievement Award from the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. So that's our introduction of Paul. If you guys have questions during Paul's talk tonight, you can either enter them in as a YouTube comment, or you can send them to the address at the uh, bottom of this slide, jseaslive at gmail.com and we will gather up those questions. Trevor Quinn will be gathering up those questions and presenting them to Paul during his presentation. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Paul Maley. Thank you. Can you all hear me? I, I hope I'm coming through fairly yes, well. Yes, you you're good, Paul. Okay, so the first slide shows um, what I typically do, and that is to drive out into the desert with my Celestron 8, uh, typically around sunset, but most normally in the middle of the night. Uh, this particular situation, I took a photo last week uh, at sunset, and you can see the beautiful colors in the sky. Uh, we typically have this almost every night or every morning uh, here in the desert, so it's, it's really pretty amazing. So when I left Houston, I had to decide where I wanted to go, and I looked at these possibilities. There were five areas that were, uh, were of interest to me. And after sorting through a lot of this, I ended up in Arizona. And of course, uh, one of the big things that I like to get away from is freeways. And I couldn't believe that in 1952 was the first dedication of the Gulf Freeway in Houston, and this proves it. Uh, you never see anything like that here where I live, uh, north of Phoenix, thank goodness. So after a rigorous discussion with my wife and my cats, who very often don't pay too much attention, but also 
dive into the subject if there's opinions that need to be had. We all agreed to move here, and that's exactly what we did. So there are two seasons in the Phoenix area. We don't have fall and we don't have spring. We basically don't have a lot of winter, but we do have the summer season and definitely the construction season. Not like the Gulf Freeway type construction, but mostly things like uh, microchip factories. And there is work on freeways, but a lot of the freeways are basically mostly clear and easy to navigate. And so uh, it's, it's a huge change from the Houston area. Uh, astronomy can be a bit challenging at times. These are the temperature stats uh, two years ago that I photographed off a weather uh, briefing from one of the local channels. You can see we've had 14 days that year of 115 degree temperatures or higher, 53 days of 110 and higher, and then low temperatures of 90 degrees, 28 days. Uh, and that was kind of amazing to me to to actually go out in the middle of the night and, and be sweating at two in the morning. Um, the overnight low temperature trend has been tracked in 20 year increments and from 2000 to 2019, you can see the dramatic rise in, uh, in overlight, in very high overnight low temperatures here. So even uh, determining when uh, to go out and view the moon, in this case, we had a lunar eclipse the other night and so they have a standard called a red telescope or a green telescope. So when the going is good for observing, it's a green telescope. And they divide it up into three areas. The uh, <clears throat> Phoenix area, which is called the valley. Uh, the rim, which is the northern part of Arizona, but stretches to the east where the elevations are reasonably high. And northern Arizona, which includes Flagstaff. And so based on the weather there, the eclipse was pretty much visible uh, in northern Arizona and actually throughout the state because it was fairly clear, although we did have some clouds come in fairly late. Now, we do have some challenges here, and one happens to be uh, people dying on the trails. Uh, I live about four miles from the Spur Cross Trail. This is a uh, <clears throat> missing hiker found dead. This was back on at the end of September, and uh, this happens now and then, and people especially those who are visiting, uh, do not realize how hot it can get. They don't come properly prepared and they end up getting lost and sometimes they're found, most of the time not. So this is an example of a typical sunset. This is not an exaggeration. I've got dozens and dozens of pictures that look very similar to this, but it gives you an idea of how amazing it really is from night to night here. So we live in a community that's at the base of Black Mountain and these are or views of, of a lot of the houses in the area. And you can see cactus and uh, very few trees, mostly typical Arizona scrub, really few. There are some people who uh, really live up in the, in the hills. This is a house that's constructed uh, to be ecologically sound and uh, it's, it's pretty high up and fairly interesting to see, but you can't get to it because there are mostly private roads that go up there. So I can look out my uh, master bathroom window and, and when the uh, ironwood trees are blooming, they, they look just like this and I can see cactus out the back and those mountains in the back when we get snow, uh, which, are, which is pretty rare, you can see the snow up on the mountains, which is about a thousand feet higher than where I live right now. We do have creatures and I've shown them in past presentations. These are new ones. This is a, a different color tarantula that came up to me while I was observing at night, I was able to get a picture of them. You can't really hear them, but every once in a while I can see them. And uh, we have lots of coyotes here as well. Here's one apparently rehearsing for the Westminster Dog Show. We also have scorpions and we have to be careful every time we try to put our foot in a shoe, it's possible that the scorpion might be hiding inside. So you need to be really careful, even inside the house. We also have fires. Uh, the fires not only are in California, in Oregon, and Washington, but they're up north of us. And this is a case where we have uh, a fire near Sedona, Arizona, and the wind typically blows from the north, and it blew a, a big plume of smoke right toward us, and we were pretty much uh, wiped out as far as observing for several days in a row, as long as that fire was going and the wind was blowing in this direction. Every once in a while, I'll come back from, from a 
an occultation observing trip. I'll come back on, on one of the highways and I can see balloon launches. We have uh, an area that just uh, about three miles from us where the balloons take off and uh, that's almost every morning. We also have tornadoes here, <clears throat> except they're not called tornadoes, they're called land spouts because typically they, they have an EF zero intensity. Uh, here are three different uh, land spouts that were observed in the Phoenix area uh, in the last two months. So typically, if you call these tornadoes, we have about three a year, and here are the three from this year. We also have strange color aberrations that appear in the sky, and this is one of them. I didn't take this picture, but I decided to, to show it just to give you an idea of what the, the clear skies and the atmosphere will produce. Now, I did buy a Celestron 11 while I was here, and I put it on the scope buggy, and I can just drag it out from my garage and put it out on my sidewalk uh, and observe uh, from there with, with relative ease. The skies aren't super dark here, but they're really pretty nice. Now, one interesting factor is, uh, although I live at the base of a mountain, up on top, uh, there are a couple of houses, one of which I can see, you'll notice it's right up there at the top. It belongs to the, the sorry, one of the ex-wives of comedian Johnny Carson, who used to be on The Tonight Show. And probably most people don't know that Johnny Carson owned a Celestron 14 and a Celestron 8, and he was an avid amateur astronomer, although he spent most of his time, uh, obviously, doing his work on television. So in the morning, if I get up before dawn, I can look out my back uh, fence and I can see cactuses that are illuminated by lights that the uh, people next door to us have put up at the base of the cactus and I can see the moon and Venus and whatever else happens to be up there. Every once in a while I can go out the back door by the pool and I can see lights uh, right on the top of the mountain and those are hikers. There are people that typically hike up especially in the winter time or the fall period and uh, I just took this photo uh, yesterday morning. So it gives you kind of an idea. You can see stars very clearly right above the, uh, the mountain as well as flashlights from the hikers. We also have pretty dramatic full moon rising over the mountain and you can see the cactus silhouetted. This happens clearly every month. And then in the morning, uh, we have sunrises that look like this. Again, this is not every day, but it's many days out of the year. We also have uh, dust devils, and this is one on the way. Uh, I had to stop along the freeway near uh, Casa Grande on the way to Tucson uh, on Interstate 10 and uh, took this photo. This must be at least a dust devil that's 100 feet or more higher. We also have wildlife here. Uh, this is a bobcat caught on my uh, backyard camera, uh, just walking by late in the afternoon. We also have javelinas. Uh, these are uh, early in the morning, and uh, we have to be really careful about them. They, they aren't dangerous in the sense that we don't spook them, but uh, they weigh 300 to 400 pounds uh, as adults, and you can't shoot them or kill them. It's against the law here, so they, they run amok eating cactus and whatever else they can find. So we have a, a monsoon period here. We don't have very much rain, the average rainfall being about two and a half inches. And uh, this gives you a, a historical trend over the last uh, 10 years of how much total rainfall we've had. Uh, it's not a whole lot, but every once in a while we, we get a lot. This year we've had eight inches of rain, so it's been quite a nice uh, monsoon season. Um, a friend of mine named Bob Hughes uh, lives not far from me, and he's taken up the uh, hobby of of drone photography. So when he sees a, a big storm front coming, he will launch his drone above his house and he can take some pretty dramatic pictures uh, with his drone camera, uh, giving you an idea of what sort of weather we've got here. This is uh, again, Bob's photo of uh, spectacular lightning flashes that we get that reach the ground. And he's able to do that also with a drone. Uh, unfortunately, my photography is not quite as good, and I don't have the processing capabilities he's got. This is this is a photo I shot off my front porch uh, in August of this year. We also have dust storms, 
And uh, luckily, we have that mountain between us and the dust storms, and the dust never really reaches us, but we can't see the dust off in the distance. This is a uh, major dust storm that uh, that was visible just south of, of Houston that crossed, uh, sorry, south of Phoenix that crossed uh, Interstate 10. We also have astronomy here. It's called the Clear Cave Creek Dark Sky Initiative, and uh, we have uh, quite an active uh, ast astronomical community where I live about 30 miles north of the center of town. Uh, this is our local newspaper called the Sonora News, and it, it has an account of October's uh, session uh, out, uh, out near here that had over 500 people show up uh, to see the stars uh, as shown by the various amateurs who, uh, who participate in the star party. Hey, Paul, sure. can I interrupt you for a second? Sure can, go ahead. Uh, so uh, back on your weather, when does your monsoon season start and end? Okay, the monsoon typically is supposed to start on June 15th and end September 30th. Okay. Uh, typically in the past, it's ended, it started uh, uh, after July 4th, but this year it began uh, right on time and it went all the way through the end of October. It, it was pretty miserable. We didn't have hardly any nights of clear sky during that period. So when the monsoon gets going, uh, you can almost put your telescope away and forget it. Okay, uh, and one other question. Sure. Uh, your extreme temperatures, how how uh, detrimental is that to your equipment? Uh, well, the equipment I use mainly is, uh, is a laptop and uh, recording, uh, uh, sorry, camera that I use to record occultations. And so far, there hasn't been any failures uh, caused by the heat, which is kind of surprising to me. So the answer is no impact. Okay, thank you. Now, many of you know that I've traveled a lot. Uh, this is a, a photo from Sarajevo uh, during, I should say, after the, uh, uh, the war. Uh, I've had to curtail that back since uh, the pandemic. But in June of last year, we, we had a, uh, an annular eclipse that was visible over Canada. I'd made plans to go out there, but Canada was closed. So the next best thing was to go on an airplane out of Minneapolis airport. And I got 18 of my friends uh, and there were other folks on this airplane, about 30 in all. And uh, we flew this pattern uh, into Ontario and then back uh, a little over three hours uh, and saw the annular eclipse very successfully. These are some of the folks. Uh, some of you may remember Chuck Harold, who used to live in Houston. Uh, Richard Nugent as well, uh, and myself, uh, my wife, Lynn Palmer, and the rest of the folks were from, from other locations. And there we are on the tarmac after the eclipse. So these are uh, photos taken by a couple of folks. You can see the annular eclipse, the, the moon obviously smaller diameter than the sun, leaving a ring of sunlight uh, visible. So the second trip I had was in October of last year, and that was our northern light uh, viewing expedition back to Alaska. Um, once again, we were successful in seeing uh, the, uh, the aurora. The, this is an example of uh, some of the group out there uh, in the snow. Uh, you can see to the lower left and the, uh, the lights of Fairbanks, Alaska is, is, is shining off the, uh, the clouds. That's what's causing that pink structure. You can see the Big Dipper on the right and obviously a, a nice aurora stream uh, in the middle. The auroras tend to uh, take on different forms, uh, make appearances at different times of the night, so one has to, to really be aware of what's going on. Uh, I think David and, and Connie have been out here before. I don't think any other folks from JSE has, has, have come up on one of these trips, but uh, if you ever feel like it, I, I can tell you that we've had 23 consecutive successful trips. Uh, here's another example of an unusual format. We had a uh, a log cabin that's actually down from the lodge. The lodge is on the left. And uh, uh, when it gets super cold and it can't get down to about minus 25 degrees Fahrenheit, we use the cabin as a place to retreat to. Here's another example of dramatic and, and weird shapes that the aurora will undertake. Um, my wife took this shot of a, of a curtain uh, across the sky. You see stars all over the background. Uh, so number Paul, of, yes, go ahead. I'm sorry, can I uh, interrupt you again? Uh, the images of the auroras, uh, how do you, what do you have to do to take those? 
I'm curious. All, all you need is a 35 millimeter camera, a DSLR on a tripod and a cable release. It's okay. uh, really quite simple. You open the shutter, ISO 1600, and you'll get something. And you just keep changing your exposure times until you get whatever it is you want. So I think okay. the main thing is for uh, people to get lucky and have the kind of activity that will cause the aurora to occur. And one important thing to note is that the solar maximum is, is predicted to be in 2026. And so the auroral activity has been ramping up uh, beginning early this past year. And uh, we hope it will continue. But right now it's, it's going great guns. So the third expedition since the pandemic was that of our uh, solar eclipse uh, ship that went from Argentina down to Antarctica. And uh, this is myself being met at the uh, airport in Buenos Aires. Um, when we got onto the ship, one of the omens, I guess, was the ring of uh, around the sun during the daytime. And this is an example of where we were traveling. We went from Ushuaia at the tip of Argentina down to uh, the Antarctic Peninsula and then back up to see the eclipse. And unfortunately, the cruise was not long enough for us to go back to Antarctica. So we had to head back to Ushuaia after the end of the eclipse. This is an example of what we consider fine dining on the airplanes inside Argentina. This is what they give you. It doesn't matter whether you're in coach or, or first class. So this is our ship um, called Le Boreal. And it was waiting for us when we got there. We had roughly 200 people on the ship. And once I got to my cabin, I could look out and I can see one of our competitor ships from Cork Expeditions. However, we found out that uh, as we were in Cork getting ready to sail, that 10 members of their crew were diagnosed with COVID and all the passengers on their ship had just arrived. Their cruise was promptly canceled. And I kept getting email after email asking them to come on board our ship. Unfortunately, we couldn't take anybody, although we had, I think, two open cabins. The, the rest of the ship was, was full. So on board our cruise, we had uh, Dr. Miloslav Druckmiller. You may recognize him from his really quite famous photographs that he's taken of eclipses. Uh, he does a lot of image stacking, creating these unique uh, images which show more of the sun than, than is humanly possible to see once you're out uh, viewing the eclipse. But that's him giving a talk and uh, he showed some pretty amazing photography. We also had uh, eclipse cakes and I had those assembled and uh, I had a very unique plan as to what to do to help people uh, to keep from being bored uh, during the cruise. And what we did is we had a cake flipping contest and the idea was to see whether the audience would select one person who would uh, win a prize at the end. And, and so those are shots from the cake flipping contest, which of course all ended up catastrophically on the floor. Um, a lot of the, the scenarios that we, we observe from just going out on the surface of the, of the deck of the ship, you see lenticular clouds, those flat saucer white clouds. You see icebergs floating by, uh, by and of course there are times you see lots and lots of clouds. Unfortunately, uh, during the cruise, we were only able to make one landing. Uh, the wind and the waves were quite high. We had planned to make at least seven. And this was really quite unexpected and unfortunate. But we had a big storm that came toward us, and it really screwed everything up. In order for us to continue on, on the way to the eclipse path, there was simply no way that we could get back uh, to where we were. So these are some of the... Uh, the wildlife that, that was visible on that island, uh, seals and penguins. These are called chin strap, chin strap penguins. And uh, if you can get up close to them, and uh, you know, they're, they're really quite uh, unafraid of humans. So this is the, uh, the weather prediction that we had for the eclipse. Uh, all that red indicates clouds and the blue indicates a forecast of clear skies. So our plan was to go north of that little white area called Coronation Island uh, to try to intercept that, that blue area. Uh, Paul, I uh, interrupt you again. I had another question that 
just came in uh, about the Alaska trips with the auroras. Mm -hmm. uh, how does the extreme cold impact your camera? Have you seen a pink aurora or are they all green hued? Uh, I have never seen a pink aurora, but they have been photographed up there. Um, when we go up, we typically go for just uh, four nights. And um, uh, the cold can impact your camera. So the battery is the first thing that goes. Uh, what typically uh, people do to counteract that, you keep extra batteries inside your parka. You also can wrap uh, uh, heaters around the camera body to prevent the camera battery from dying. But that, uh, that cabin that's out there next to our viewing area has, uh, has heat in there. It's also got AC uh, charging plugs. So you can go in there and, and uh, if you bring multiple batteries, you can charge those batteries that have gone down. So that's one way to help uh, counteract that. I hope that answers the question. Anyway, this, uh, this is the 30 hour forecast prior to the eclipse. Now, we got no further information after 30 hours because we lost internet. So the plan was to try to go up to where we thought the uh, clouds would not, would not be. And so the ship headed up in that direction. And uh, here are some of the folks on deck, uh, you know, getting their cameras ready and hopefully getting ready to see the eclipse. Um, you'll notice here, 20 minutes before totality, we had nice broken skies. But on the bottom of the picture, you will see a fog bank. And although we did our best to get out of the fog, it didn't happen. And we got swallowed up in the fog and we did not see totality, although it did get dark. Uh, I can't play the movie sequence here because there's no way to uh, to do that uh, over straight. Oh, wait a minute, maybe it is working, hold on. It's going very fast. If you, uh, if you watch, it should uh, hopefully get a little bit dark. You can see there are plenty of places in there. We thought there it is breaking up. We think it's going to be fantastic. And then, boom, that was it. So um, as is my tradition, I put up the Texas flag uh, on the back of the ship. And uh, after this, we took a, uh, a group picture. And prior to the group picture, I had four or five women who were very upset about the Texas flag. They brought their politics on board the ship and created a, a fuss. So I decided not to put the Texas flag up, put, uh, let the uh, French flag fly. I'm not going to do that again, but it gives you an idea of what can happen even on an eclipse trip when politics enters the situation. So this is all of our group. We also had a uh, traditional eclipse cake, a cake, which I had designed uh, for everybody. And of course, it was gobbled up after the eclipse was over with. Um, in the end, there were roughly 13 ships in the area. Uh, these are uh, little representations of the locations of those ships. Ours is uh, the one with the uh, circle around it. There was only one ship that saw it, and that is by total luck. And they were actually up toward the Falkland Islands, uh, where the eclipse, the eclipse sun was actually very close to the horizon. But everybody else was clouded out. So then we had another eclipse uh, expedition, sorry, a Northern Lights expedition this past March. This was expedition number four since the, the great pandemic. And again, we had spectacular luck. Uh, Ann Jones uh, took this uh, shot. This is her first uh, uh, photo. You can see it's a reasonably long exposure because the stars are trailed, but really nice aurora. And you can see plenty of snow in March is when we get typically two feet of snow on the ground. Uh, we have a lot of interesting shapes and forms. Uh, these are, uh, uh, this is another set uh, of images taken by uh, Raquel and Vincent Milano. Uh, Anne took this, and here you can see what might be termed the pink fringe. It's not really a pink aurora, but depending on the exposure time and the ISO, you can get different colors indicating either oxygen or nitrogen. Uh, this is a very bright band, and there you see the lodge uh, in the snow below, as well as a, a faint band that's, that's rising up. This is the direction of the northeast. And the uh, aurora typically starts low in the northeast and rises up until it gets overhead sometimes. 
So here's the shot that I took. It's probably one of the really coolest shots that I've ever taken. These, these images uh, are just really dramatic. This was taken with an eight millimeter uh, lens. And I, I think it's just super. This is another example of a different kind of Aurora uh, format. It's, it's very wavy. You can see the, uh, the big dipper that's, uh, that looks like it's almost directly overhead. Uh, we're at latitude 63, so the North Star is 63 degrees above the north horizon. And that, that glow down in the lower right is the glow from the town of Fairbanks. Here's another example of uh, that same system that's changing shape. And this is what I call the alien predator because it looks exactly like the character in the, in the movie Alien. Uh, sorry, Predator, excuse me. And uh, I, did, I was really surprised to get that. And I call this the hand of God because it really looks like one. And it also occurred during that March trip and just metamorphosized from, from a shape that, that, you know, you, you really can't tell what it is because so many things are happening in such a short period of time that uh, the shapes change in a matter of seconds to sometimes minutes. Here's another example of a shot that I took of a, of a corona where the aurora is directly overhead and just expands uh, downward from the zenith. Uh, in the wintertime, we often uh, get a chance to take folks to the, the local dog races. They have uh, uh, typically anywhere from four to eight dogs uh, that are being pulled or that are pulling a sled and we go out there for about an hour and, and come back. Uh, at night or late in the afternoon, because sun, the sun typically goes down about 4.30 uh, in March, we, <clears throat> we have the uh, ice carving competition. Uh, stand by just one second. There is a ice carving competition that occurs uh, at one of the parks in downtown Phoenix, and we take people down there to see that. There's all kinds of different uh, shapes and things that are carved by an international group of, of ice carvers. So <clears throat> other things not related to trips. Uh, in July, the Chinese launched a, uh, uh, a science lab to their, uh, uh, to their space station called the Wintian Science Lab. And there was a Chinese rocket associated with that, which fell to Earth. Uh, I was lucky enough to get the last photo before it re-entered, roughly six hours before re-entry. Uh, here in Arizona, it, the sky was almost 100% cloudy. <clears throat> and if you can see the, uh, the trail in this uh, picture, you can see the flashes as the rocket is tumbling over and over again. And uh, this is the last image before it splashed down in the ocean. Um, I did pick up a, a fake video uh, that I saw online. This is uh, pretended to be what's called Blue Walker 3, which is supposed to be a very large antenna. See that bright blob and just below center? Uh, it looks like you can see the entire shape of it. And then you see a group of dots, which are supposedly a Starlink group of satellites. Well, this is a fake video that somebody put up uh, and purported it to be a Falcon 9 uh, rocket launch. And nothing about this matched up. But if nobody knew the difference, they would think it was real. So one thing, uh, where I'm located, I'm roughly 800 kilometers uh, from Vandenberg Air Force Base. And so every once in a while, we get lucky and there's a rocket launch out there. And I happened to walk out uh, onto my driveway and I saw this white cloud uh, right on the horizon. This is an elevation of about four to five degrees. Uh, you see these black clouds coming in because we had a storm coming in from the north. But I happen to notice this this white cloud, and clearly it uh, it it is definitely a, a cloud that's illuminated as a result of the, of the sun reflecting off ice crystals uh, after the launch of the uh, of the Starlink satellite group that that uh, was linked to that that fake video. But then back in October 27th, not too long ago, we had a spectacular SpaceX launch that was actually visible in clear sky from Arizona. And here you can see it with a crescent moon. And uh, it was really a pretty dramatic sight here. Uh, now we have another expedition in September of this past year, uh, a little less than two months ago, up to the north. And it's fall up there. This is our lodge in the fall. You can see all the aspens and pine trees they have. 
as you look toward the north. Um, and here we were lucky again, have another nice set of aurora images, which I'll kind of run through uh, fairly quickly. As you can see again, most of these are green and uh, that's the typical appearance of the aurora to the naked eye, uh, as well as uh, to the camera. Depending on how long you can expose, you can sometimes get uh, purple or pink. Um, in this case, you can see this, this sort of curvy arc and I'm wondering whether actually this might be a, an artifact of the, of the image processing here, I'm not sure. And then just shooting up into the sky uh, in the east when there's no aurora around, you can see uh, the Milky Way. I think this is like a 10 second exposure with ISO 1600. And, uh, and there's the, the, the current cabin that's being used at the lodge. I just got back from uh, Cyprus and uh, we went to a place called Akrotiri and Peculia, which is a British sovereign base located uh, on the island of Cyprus. And so you can see from, from this area, this uh, depiction shows the visibility of the partial solar eclipse on October 25th. It was visible over most all of Europe and uh, in parts of Asia, as well as the Middle East. My original plan was to go to, uh, to Dubai, but the airfare got too expensive, so I ended up going to, uh, uh, to Cyprus. And so this is Cyprus. You can see it's 150 miles from a great vacation spot called Beirut. And uh, here we are. Uh, you can see that in 1974, Turkey invaded Cyprus and took over half of it. Cyprus is owned by Greece. And as a result, the British established uh, two bases. Those are the ones in green. And we were uh, just adjacent to Dekelia base, which is uh, again occupied by, by Britain. So there's our site. There's Larnaca Airport where we landed. And of all things, there's a Messier Marathon site that's listed uh, on Google Maps shown just below the airport. So uh, it turns out that uh, my plans for observing the eclipse worked out really well. This is the actual weather pattern on eclipse day. You can see that basically there were lots of clouds, but where we were, there were none. In fact, this was sunrise on eclipse day. You can see totally calm water. We're out there eating breakfast, just looking at the sun as it, as it rose. Um, so I had a bit of a problem. Uh, what I wanted to do is to uh, observe from a, a balcony room uh, fairly high up that would face the eclipse. And they said, nope, sorry, can't do that because the hotel was full. So then I got thinking, well, what about the roof? So I went up and I saw this sign up there. It said it wouldn't, essentially the roof was locked and nobody could go up there. So I went down and had a meeting with the manager and explained to him what I wanted to do. And he finally said, okay, we'll let you go out on the roof and observe the eclipse. So that was really nice because uh, I had my own site located under their satellite dish. I could just sit there in a chair and use my camera and take photos. You can see uh, the landscape and, and the background. Um, and so here's an example of, of the first, a little after first contact uh, after lunch. And the uh, sun was nice and, and cool. You can see sunspots. Uh, this was the maximum, it was only 36%, but still it was a cool solar eclipse. Uh, this is last contact, so the whole thing lasted about two and, out, two and a half hours, but very impressive and a nice test for uh, my new camera that I, that I bought. So I just mentioned a, a new satellite called Blue Walker 3 that was launched uh, a couple of months ago. You may have heard of it. It is planning uh, to deploy a 10 meter size array, uh, an antenna array, which supposedly will be the brightest object in the sky, even brighter than the Iridium satellites when they were launched. Uh, this is a real potential threat to ground-based astronomy, in particular the Vera Rubin Observatory. Um, this morning, today is November the 11th at 6.15 a.m., uh, I was able to confirm that uh, the satellite was first magnitude, and up until this morning, it had been somewhere between plus seven and plus 10, essentially invisible to the naked eye. But this morning, uh, it was as bright as Castor and Pollux and came directly overhead. We have another overhead pass tomorrow morning. So it looks like they're getting ready to deploy the solar array, and we'll see if it is minus 12 or whatever their 
they're talking about it uh, turning into. So this is something that could be really bad for astronomy. I think you all need to be at least aware of what's going on. We have uh, two trips coming up in 2023 to see the Northern Lights. Uh, March is already full. September, we haven't opened up yet. Uh, that'll be open probably in the next uh, few weeks. We only take about 16 people uh, because the lodge is very small. And again, everybody that's gone up there is, has seen the lights. So here's the, uh, the graphic showing the progression of the solar cycle. Uh, right now, that, uh, that curve indicates where it's predicted to be, although the solar activity is actually much higher at this point in time. So I get alerts all the time indicating that there's been some sort of a coronal mass ejection, which typically stimulates the magnetic field of the Earth. So right now we've got four major solar eclipses coming up. I think all of you know about, about some of these. October 14th will be the annular eclipse that will be coming uh, through uh, Texas as well as uh, uh, Arizona. Uh, I'm going to be observing from Monument Valley, which is that green area where the cloud predictions are roughly 3 and 10 that will be cloudy as opposed to San Antonio, Corpus Christi, and that area where it's 5 and 10 that it'll be cloudier there. Uh, this was the weather at eclipse time this year, and uh, it was totally clear. So I have every confidence we'll be, be clear again next year. On uh, April 8th, 2024, will be the, the next great American eclipse, except it will also be visible in Mexico and in the Pacific Ocean. You can see here the uh, the prediction of clouds is significantly higher in the United States, beginning in Texas and moving uh, toward Newfoundland. Uh, it just gets cloudy and cloudier uh, based on the average April cloud amount for that date. So right now we have a, a cruise ship that's going to leave Cabo San Lucas with, again, 98 cabins. I think we've got 13 left that haven't been sold. And uh, I'll be on that ship. And so, I, unfortunately, I cannot be with the ground group in Mazatlan uh, that uh, David Haviland and two other folks of ours will be, uh, will be leading that group. And we hope to, to see four minutes and 25 seconds, not only from our ship, but also from Mazatlan. Uh, the next total eclipse will be uh, August in 2026. Now, you'll, you'll notice the different colors. The colors represent the, the potential cloudy situation or clear situation based on the fractional cloud amount in that vertical scale. You can see that it's predicted to be mostly cloudy uh, along the ocean, and in, at the best place to observe it will be northern Spain. And so I have a group that will be going there. Uh, we plan to launch that expedition uh, online here in the next uh, few months. Um, and then here is the cloud image of August 12th uh, from this year. You can see it's, it, it more or less lived up to expectations. The, it was mostly cloudy over the ocean and clear in Spain, where we can see one minute, 44 seconds uh, in 2026. And then finally, the biggest eclipse of all time for everybody, six minutes, 23 seconds of totality on August 2nd, 2027. So it's the big eclipse to plan for. Uh, you can see, again, from the color scheme that uh, the best places to see it over, over the Mediterranean, places like Algeria, Libya, uh, Morocco, and Egypt. Not exactly your best uh, uh, safest locations, but we do plan to send a uh, land group into Egypt. And I hope we'll have a Red Sea cruise as well. But uh, we are planning this. And again, it's going to be the biggest eclipse that anyone can expect to see in their lifetime. Our site, I hope, will be at the Temple of Luxor, uh, which is probably the, the best location for silhouetting both the sun and various statues in the same field of view. This will be a challenging eclipse because the sun will be quite high up. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. Uh, Paul, one last question that came in uh, on your uh, cloud uh, predictions. Is the cloud fraction the probability of being cloudy? Yes. So oh, here, here you see the blue indicates the bluer it is, the less likelihood that it'll be cloudy. The more orange it is, the higher the probability is that it will be. Cloudy. Okay. Here's Thank you. Question. Okay.
Doug, back to you. Okay, Paul, thank you very much for being our speaker tonight. And that was a fantastic presentation. Thank you for putting all that together for us this evening. Next, oh, next, uh, the meeting after the meeting. So when we get done here, this is kind of unusual. We're gonna have an online meeting, but then after the meeting, we're gonna meet at Mod Pizza, the one at uh, Clear Lake City Boulevard in El Dorado in front of the HEB. So we're gonna have a partial in-person meeting, a partial online meeting. So the online meeting, but as soon as we get done, we're gonna to go to Mod Pizza and have our traditional after the meeting meeting. Next up, we have uh, Dan Royd. He has a member's minute called Spread the Word. Take it away, Dan. Okay, you guys can hear me, I hope? Hello? You're good, Dan. Good, good, good. Yeah, I wanted to uh, bring your attention to the fact that um, this is the heck of a club. I mean, look, we had a, <laughs> we had a talk by Paul. I mean, one of the very best people in the business are talking at our meetings. Um, it's local. It works uh, as well with uh, the Lunar Planetary Institute. It's free. The price is right. And uh, there is no bureaucracy here. We don't even have elections, for heaven's sake. That's good. We have an extensive video library and on and on and on. What I like particularly and the reason why I joined was the Q&A. And Doug, you handle that very well. Having Q&A is one of the main reasons why <laughs> young folks should join clubs like that. So it took me a while, believe it or not, when I came to Houston from my native Pittsburgh PA, it took me a while to find Jesse AS. And that's why I say we should spread the word. We should tell our friends, our church, our colleagues, whoever, about this club, because I think that's the heck of a value. Recently, I was invited by friends at NASA, good buddies. I think I had fixed a telescope for one of them, and they invited me to be with their booth at the Energy Day in, uh, where was that? It was at the uh, Sam Houston Park. Yeah, that's right. Sam Houston Park um, in uh, Houston proper on uh, October the 15th. And so I consider that an honor because after all, I fell in love with the US because of NASA. I love NASA, went to work for NASA when I came to this country. And so uh, I was very happy to have this opportunity to tell everybody who would listen uh, what we have to offer. And in particular, I share a list of URLs that everybody can uh, then uh, bring home, including, of course, Stellarium, which is my uh, favorite uh, uh, software. And of course, I had our flyer. I had uh, printed 100 copies of this with uh, our address, the, the address of the uh, LPI uh, in the back. And uh, they were gone. They were gone in no time. So I don't know how many people uh, will remember us, but that's what I mean uh, by uh, by sharing this uh, information about the club. And um, I still have a bunch of charts and uh, and pictures that I got from our friend uh, uh, at uh, at LPI. Um, and um, I um, I can certainly have uh, some uh, left. So if you come to uh, Lake City uh, Astronomy in the park, uh, no problem. I will be able to give you one. I uh, would reserve uh, actually those uh, those uh, charts from Andy Shanner at the uh, at the uh, LPI uh, to teachers. But there was a, uh, a cute kid in the booth uh, at the end of the show. Her, ma her mother was trying to pack, and the kid was not helpful. So finally, I uh, was able to help a little bit, and she was profusely uh, thanking me, and I told her about the club and said, I should thank you because finally I got a job I can handle. It was a very nice opportunity to share. So please keep doing that. Keep sharing the good news about our club. After all, uh, uh, this is uh, the heck of a pr price performance ratio. So I had done. Thank you, Dan. Doug, back to you. Okay, Dan, thank you for that member's minute. We have one more member's minute. I'm going to tell you about an upper stage rocket imaging from the El Dorado Star Party. <clears throat> so a couple weeks ago, I was out at the El Dorado Star Party and uh, I was actually doing a time-lapse uh, video of the Milky Way in the clouds, which I'm gonna show you here in just a minute. But while my camera was set up, uh, a rocket came by 
And what this is, if you look at this uh, image here, this is the moon here, and this is a rocket. And what this is, is this is an upper stage burn of a rocket while it's in orbit. This is not a launch, this is actually an upper stage burn. And you can tell that by the shape of the plume here, um, and also the, the direction it's heading. So anyway, this is a moon, this is a rocket. And each one of these exposures is a 15 second exposure. So you can see about how far the thing has moved in each 15 seconds. So we're out there at the El Dorado Star Party and this thing came flying by and uh, for whatever reason, I guess it went behind some thing here and you can see the little line there and the light behind it. So, and then let me show you the time-lapse video of this. The time-lapse goes by really fast, the rocket part of it. So you have to, it'll, it'll repeat hopefully if this works right. Okay, so there goes the rocket, just zip by. This is gonna repeat so you can uh, see it. Uh, but it's the Milky Way in the clouds, but also it's the, the moon setting and this rocket coming by. Here it is again. There it went by again. You might see in here, this is Sagittarius. There's the, the teapot. There's the spout. Here's the, the handle. Here's the lid. There's the body. So you can see Sagittarius there. There it goes by again. Time-lapse video. Uh, just accidentally caught this rocket uh, doing a in-orbit burn, but I thought it was kind of cool. And I thought I would share that with you guys. All right, let's see here if I can get out of this. So I'll be posting this on my web page. And if you want to see any of my other things I've been telling you guys about for years, so you can find them all at www.holland-observatory.net. And I have my pictures and videos and documents and all kinds of stuff there if you're interested. All right, next up we have David with Star Party News. David, you have a go. All right, Star Party news for November. Oops, let me get on the right screen. Had a bunch of things transpire in the past. October 18th, we had the Star Party at Alvin Community College. Uh, we're going to talk about that shortly. And then the three things all at once. October 27th through 30th, Fort McCavitt. That shouldn't say confirmed. It should say completed. Um, at October 24th through the 29th, El Dorado, and then we had on October 20, also on 29th, Houston Astronomy Day at the George. So we had three things colliding all at once. Uh, to finish up, November 4th, which is actually a week ago today, Hack Winery Outreach, they asked me to cancel the event because it was close to 90% chance of rain, and by 7 o'clock it was pretty much pouring in the, uh, in the Santa Fe area. So... We might, be, we might reschedule that one. Um, coming up, November 16th, I believe that is this Wednesday, we've got an outreach with UHCL. Um, we've got the message from Doug that the loading dock in the area in the north side of the STEM building is where they're going to want us to congregate in that area to set up. Currently, as of right now, of course, weather, as we know, can change on a moment's notice. Uh, the weather is slated for partly cloudy with a 16% chance. So, you know, maybe we might be able to see a few things. December 3rd, uh, the first uh, Saturday in, um, uh, in December, we've got one more event with the Magnolia Creek Golf Club. And I'll, again, follow up with an email as that place can be a little difficult to get to if you're a first timer. We'll have an 81% moon that, that night, and it'll be, it'll be visible throughout the night, weather, per, weather permitting. I've got to double check because I may be booked at the George, but we'll see we'll see how that goes. That's pretty much it for 2022. Now for 2023, we've got Hack asking for uh, at least six dates. LPI says they want to come back and have uh, book us for some dates with the um, uh, Family Space Days. Uh, the libraries in Clear Lake and Webster have uh, pinged me a little bit, saying we we might want to think about something in 2023. Uh, I'm going to leave it with Trevor since he's sort of taking point on the Alvin Community College and whether or not we're going to be coming back to that. And then uh, Leslie uh, from last month, Leslie reported we had a good time at the uh, Challenger Park and that they are definitely asking us to, uh, to come back. So a lot of these as they come in and become official get, will get put on the website. Fort dates and some of the more critical star parties such as El Dorado and Tech TSP. Uh, are already are already on there. And so on the 18th, um, Al Star Party at Alvin Community College was a clear night. I hope I've got everybody's names. Uh, Bob and Leslie Eaton, Mark Vichelis, uh, Trevor, Doug, and uh, Reed Klotzer were there with about 30 or 35 in attendance. And you can 
see over here is is is, is uh, Bob and the mule on, and Leslie's over here with her binoculars. Uh, I'm pretty sure that is Mark's uh, uh, Mark's telescope there. Doug looks like he's trying to find something <laughs> in the skies to look at. Here's Bob Eaton again, Mark, and then um, uh, uh, Reed over here. It didn't seem to get Trevor, but then he was thankfully taking the pictures. Fort McCavitt uh, took place when about 50 in attendance on the Saturday night star party. Weather was a factor. And one individual wanted to come out to the George, and he basically, I think, spent part of Friday, Thursday or Friday, and then immediately came home. Uh, but as it overlapped with the El Dorado Star Party and other things going on in the Houston area, uh, this one was kind of a bust in a way. But at least we were represented by Ken and Lisa. A gentleman named, named Mark Stein came out from the Austin area. Ken and Lisa brought their big six, 16 and 8-inch daubs and plus some scopes. And they had folks come out from uh, Kerrville, San Angelo, Austin, and, uh, and Menard. El Dorado. Doug, feel free to chime in if you want. As I understand, it was mainly attended by you and Al Mallory. This is a cool picture of the uh, of the field. You see a lot of scopes are put to bed because people are waiting until nightfall. I really like this picture with a nice sunset. That was really nicely done. Um, I'm assuming this is a, this is Doug's setup as well as this. But we also heard about downdraft microburst something came through and what was it doug something like 10 seconds everything was flattened and a number of people's scopes were uh, unfortunately knocked over including oops including yours so hopefully your uh, your scope will survive will survive to, to live past this event on 29th we had a, a, a astronomy day at the george it was a good first start it was a very limited event uh, it was decided that we were going to hold attendance to 500, but between the Astros and the World Series and wings over Houston and nice weather, only about 323 tickets were sold totally. Attendance was steady throughout the day. It was one of the fortunate things. We never had people wrapped around the domes, which is what we wanted to try to avoid when organizing this. We had six deck scopes, one pair of binoculars, and we had all three, uh, all three domes open. They had the West Dome open for me as well. Two indoor talks and outdoor talks. The LPI came out and was a major crowd pleaser with their lunar demos, demos and samples. What really got with the kids was the um, uh, impact display where they put in the, the fine powdered sand, a little bit of cocoa, and then you can actually see how ejecta blankets form. But this is a, a kind of a butchered image through EAA that, that uh, Jay Thomas and I did of uh, M31 from the West Dome using the 14-inch uh, in, in there. I also grabbed a little bit of the moon since it was the moon was out and part of a player. Uh, Jeff Lepp and a gentleman whose name I just dropped in the East Dome. We had uh, 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 Bill Christian and Mac Hooten other than the Research Dome. And this is before all the activity took place. This is people setting up on the deck itself. Don't have a lot of pictures of activity because once the people came around, we all got busy. But they have a very nice new uh, pavilion for presentations. Um, uh, he's showing the, the lady, the op general operation of the research dome. Todd Dunavet is helping Steve uh, Steve Clayworth with his, with his uh, uh, refractor. I actually did button duty for about 40 minutes. And overall, it was a pretty good day. They're really happy with the number of volunteers that came out. Uh, I was particularly grateful for uh, Jay Ford come out, as well as uh, Susan and Bruce Pollard from NHAC who came down. Uh, again, overall, it was a good first start. And not so much comedy, but uh, I'm hearing a lot of jokes from my friends that I love looking at the stars on a winter clear night, that it's only 4 p.m. So with that, Doug, that's, uh, that's it. All right, back to you, Doug. Okay, David, thank you very much. That was a great star party report. Yeah, it is unfortunate we had so many things on the same day, but you know, that's that's good. At least we have things to do. All right, so that's the end of our meeting. And uh, our next meeting will be December 9th and it's to be determined. So we're thinking about having another one of our uh, meetings where we have a series of short talks from JSCAS uh, members. Uh, we might do that and we're going to try it we'll try to do it as an in-person meeting at the lpi if we can't if not we'll do it at uh clear lake but that's our plan for right now and we'll just see if we can get enough talks to do that and if we're not we'll do something different 
So that's it. And uh, for all the local people here, see you at Mod Pizza whenever you guys can get over there. The one at Clear Lake City Boulevard in El Dorado. So signing off. Thanks for attending.